watch that video all day long. That's the best part of these, I think. And again, for those of you that are new, that video is from Mike Olbinski. And you need to go follow him on YouTube or Vimeo. His videos of severe weather are unbelievably good. And I want to thank Mike for letting us use that on the uh, Weather School videos we have done this year. Mike Olbinski, O-L-B-I-N-S-K-I. Well, I'm a little sad <laughs> because it's the last Weather School of the year. Wow. You know, every year I'm in uh, dozens and dozens and really hundreds of schools. And uh, this year, obviously, we've had to do it online for a few months, which is fine. But I do miss being in the schools. And before you know it, the fall is going to be here and hopefully things are back to normal by then. But uh, it's always kind of sad in May when the school year wraps up. But uh, hey, this is what we're going to do today. This is this is a test. And listen, don't panic. There's no need to freak out. No need to be upset. No need to be anxious because my tests are easy and they don't count. Okay, but this is a little examination to see how much you've learned about weather. And again, uh, you know, this is kind of designed for kids. But if you're an adult, you might want to take this exam too to see how much you've learned. And just maybe you'll learn something new today. All right. So we're going to get right to it. Ladies and gentlemen, Spans Weather School final exam. And let me just start with a kind of a personal one here. You ought to know this. Come on. If you've seen me at your school or if you've watched, I think you should know this by now. I have a favorite season. Everybody should have a favorite season. Okay. Think about yours. I probably know what yours is, but mine might be different. So Span's favorite season. It's one of these four. And keep up with how many you get right, how many you get wrong, okay? And remember, my tests don't count. If you flunk, it's okay. Uh, but if you make a 100, that'll be kind of cool. So my favorite season is, yeah, you know this, it's winter. I know that most of you like summer because you're out of school and, the, you know, you go outside and you have fun. But for some reason, I just love winter. And again, where I live down here in the Deep South, it doesn't snow much. It doesn't. But every once in a while, it can, and it's just magical. That's some of the video from uh, Kevin Henderson from his drone. So I hope you got that one right, all right? But again, that one really doesn't matter. So let's get right to the core of this stuff, all right? So at the TV station where I work and here in my home office, and I'm at home like you are, the weather wall, the wall behind me, is what color? And if you were with us last week, we took you on a tour of my TV station, the ABC affiliate in Birmingham. So the weather wall is what color? You got blue, green, red, or turquoise. I think you know the answer. I think you know the answer. The weather wall is, ladies and gentlemen, yeah, green. I mean, it is a nasty green. You don't see a lot of green like that in people's houses, but I've got it here and I've got it at the TV station. And most TV stations use that color. It, it tends to chrome a key well and it works nicely. And most people don't have clothes that are that type of color. So, all right, hopefully you're two for two. Let's go to question number three. We, let's talk about weather instruments. That is a big part of what I do. What weather instrument measures water vapor? What instrument measures water vapor? So one of these four, just take your pick. It's either A, a barometer, B, an anemometer, C, a hygrometer, or D, a thermometer. It's one of those. Do you know? Pick one. And the right answer, it is C, a hygrometer. We have weather instruments all over the uh, state. And a big part of that is a hygrometer that measures water vapor. And uh, that, in turn, lets us calculate humidity and dew point. And that's a really important part of weather forecasting is knowing how much water vapor is in the air. So a hygrometer measures water vapor. Hope you're scoring well so far. I think you are. All right. So let's go right back to it, ladies and gentlemen. Are you ready for the next question? So let me show you a map. That map, okay? I see some H's, I see some L's, I see some numbers, a whole bunch of numbers. And this was the surface map actually two days ago. Looking down there at the bottom, I can see this was the surface map from Tuesday, May 12th. But here's my question. On that map, you see some blue H's. Blue H's, okay? 
what in the world does the H mean on that map? Does it mean hot? Does it mean humid? Does it mean high pressure? Or does the H stand for hamburger? All right, so again, on that map right there, you see those blue H's. What does it stand for? Does it stand for hot, humid, high pressure, or hamburger? And the right answer, ladies and gentlemen, is C. Yeah, I put hamburger on there because I'm probably hungry, but, you know, a barometer measures the weight of the air, and all of those lines that are kind of concentric circles, those are called isobars. Those connect cities with the same barometric pressure. And when the pressure gets really high, you stick a blue H on that map. And that means air is relatively heavy and it's sinking. The fancy science word is subsidence. And typically it doesn't rain. It's a beautiful day. So an H on that weather map means high pressure. All right, next question, ladies and gentlemen. This one's hard. Ooh, this is hard. Hardest one so far. But we talked about this way back, I think, in our first episode. And by the way, all of these are on YouTube if you want to go back and watch these later. Weather balloons. And we launch these twice a day, every morning at where I am. It's 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. this time of the year. Weather balloons carry a device. And this device does all the work. It measures the weather on the way up. The balloon doesn't do that. The balloon is just a device that carries this thing up. So what is that device called? carried by a weather balloon? Is it a satellite, an android, a psychrometer, or a radio sonde? Uh-huh. I told you guys this is going to be kind of a hard one. This, this is one of the hardest ones in the entire exam set, okay? So uh, think about this. A, B, C, or D. Weather balloons carry a device called a satellite, an android, a psychrometer, or a radio sonde. And the right answer is D, radio sonde, that thing. Yeah, that does all the work when the balloons are launched inside that box. And by the way, that is a harmless weather instrument. It says it right there on the, on the label. But inside the box, we have weather instruments and a radio transmitter. And that's what does all the work. Uh, you know, the balloons are cool. And again, the, the balloons are typically filled with hydrogen these days. There might be a few offices that still use helium, but there's a shortage of helium and uh, it's kind of expensive. But the balloon is the cool part. But that long 80-foot cord has a parachute, the little orange thing you see there. And then way down at the bottom, we've got the radio sonde. And uh, he's got the radio sonde in his hand, and that's once the cord gets tight, he lets go, and that thing goes up 50, 70, 100,000 feet. And on the way up, it sends back weather information. But the little box he's got in his hand that's about to go up is called a radio sonde. Hope you got that one right. All right, let's go to the next one, ladies and gentlemen. Let's talk about weather satellites, okay? Weather satellites. Weather satellites are used to detect... A, wildfires, B, clouds, C, dust, or D, all of the above. Okay, weather satellites are used to detect wildfires, clouds, dust, or all of the above. Be thinking about your answer, and, and this really two different kinds of weather satellites. One weather satellite is in geosynchronous orbit as the Earth spins, so you always see the same perspective. Those are geostationary, and those are over the equator. We also have polar orbiting satellites that give us different views, but the geostationary satellites are about 22,000 miles up, and they're very, very important. So the question is, what do they, they detect? You got A, B, C, or D, and the right answer, ladies and gentlemen, is... D, all of the above. It's amazing the satellite technology we have now. The new GOES satellite, that's Geostationary Operational Environmental Satellite, uh, has such high-resolution sensors. You can detect dust coming off the continent of Africa that might restrict hurricane development. In fact, on that image, you can actually see some dust coming off the coast of Africa. You can see smoke from wildfires. We watched smoke from wildfires in the Gulf Coast region this week, 
And, of course, you got the clouds and really a lot more. It's so much that they can do for us. So weather satellites are a big deal, and the right answer is all of the above. All right, radar fans, let's talk about radar. You know, everybody looks at radar, and I get a lot of radar questions, which is good. But you need to really understand radar and how it works because guess what? One day you're going to be looking at your phone, that fancy phone you got here, and you're not going to have me to help you. And you really need to know how that thing works, okay? So the next question involves radar. So here we go. A hook echo. Hook echo. That's a strange term. But if you watched us, you ought to know what that means. A hook echo on radar can mean a hurricane, A, B, a tsunami, C, a tornado, or D, drought. So a hook echo on radar, A, B, C, or D, hurricane, tsunami, tornado, or drought. I really want you guys to learn radar this summer. I, let me tell you what, some second and third and fourth grade students I know, they're the best radar technicians that I've seen. They're really good with radar. You can learn this stuff, okay? So the right answer is... C, a hook echo on radar can mean a tornado. That's a hook echo right there. Uh, you see in the back of the storm in the colors of yellow and orange, there is the shape of a hook. Everything, every block of color in that map, it's a, an echo. That's the way radar works. It sends out beams of energy. The beams of energy bounce off raindrops. They bounce back to the antenna. And we put on a map where the bounces are coming from. And the... Weaker echoes are the grays, the blues, the greens. That's light rain. The really strong returned energy, that's red and white. But again, we're looking at that hook. And where's the tornado? Yeah, you know this. You know this. It's right there at the end of the hook. In fact, that little spot of red and white, that's a debris ball. That's where debris is being lofted from the ground. Things like tree limbs and branches and nails and glass and bricks and parts of buildings and that's the radar beam bouncing off that and that was a pretty bad tornado that was one of the ones from nine years ago so a hook echo can mean a tornado now listen sometimes you'll see a hook echo and there might not be a tornado there but sometimes there is and that's what we look for hope you're doing well all right let's go to the next one clouds that grow taller and taller and taller they grow vertically just like you now, in some cases, when you're old like me, you tend to grow shorter. You know, gravity sets in, but you are growing taller. So what are the clouds that grow taller? What are they called? Cumulus, stratus, cirrus, or fog. One of those is the right answer, okay? Clouds that grow taller. Cumulus, A, B, stratus, C, cirrus. D, fog. And by the way, some of you guys are doing great watching the comments coming in here. We got some real weather weenies here in this group. This is outstanding. Uh, and I love clouds. And again, let me just encourage you guys to look up sometimes, you know, and, and I think that's one good thing about maybe kind of slowing down a little bit. We can do things like that. I'm so busy. There are days I just don't even have time to think. But as things slow down a little bit, I've been looking up at the sky a little more, and I've seen some cool stuff. And by watching clouds, it is just awesome. Now, some people like to watch birds and stuff. That's great. But I'm a cloud watcher, and I've loved clouds ever since I was little. So one more time, clouds that grow taller, they develop vertically. A, B, C, or D, the right answer, ladies and gentlemen, is A, yes, Cumulus clouds, they start off and they look like little marshmallows over there on the left of the screen. And they grow taller and taller and taller. When they get really big, you call it cumulonimbus, and that's when you've got rain and thunder and lightning going on. That's a thunderstorm. Uh, fog is a cloud sitting on the ground. It doesn't do anything. Stratus, that's low gray clouds. And cirrus, those are high clouds. And cirrus clouds are cool. They're ice crystals. Never rains from them. But there you go. Good job. All right, next question, ladies and gentlemen, is about lightning. And by the way, I hope you know how to spell lightning. There is no E. I will give you a hint. 
I get a lot of, and again, look, I, I understand. I, I'm not that good at spelling some words, but a lot of people spell it lightning, and that's not it. You spell lightning how? L-I-G-H-T-N-I-N-G. And this question is about lightning, not lightning. Lightning heats the air too. And the flash in the channel of air where that electrical current rolls through. How hot? Is it 90 degrees Fahrenheit? 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit? That's B. C, 50,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Or D, 20 below zero Fahrenheit. So what's the right answer? Lightning heats the air up in just an instant. The blink of an eye. A, 90 B, 1,000 degrees. C, 50,000 degrees. And D, 20 below zero. The right answer is C, 50,000 degrees Fahrenheit, approximately. And that is hotter than the surface of the sun. And what happens, the air is so hot, so quickly, it expands so rapidly, there's basically an explosion, and we know that noise as... Thunder. Uh Uh-huh. All right. Next question also involves lightning. This is a lightning safety question. One thing we want people to do is to be safe. And, you know, summertime is almost here. And for a lot of you, you live in a part of the country where almost every afternoon we have thunderstorms. And they're not, you know, they're not going to produce a tornado. They just happen every afternoon. And the the one thing you got to remember, they've all got a lot. And I mean, these summer storms can have a lot of lightning, okay? So what's the rule? You should know this. Get inside. Get inside if lightning is within how many miles? A, four miles. B, eight miles. C, 15 miles. Or D, 200 miles, okay? So you need to get inside if lightning is, and by the way, inside, that means a house or a car, a vehicle, a bus, a truck, a building, a business, a church, a school, just get in something, okay? So is it A, B, C, or D? The right answer, ladies and gentlemen, is B, eight miles. That's the rule. And I say that's the rule. You know, technically, I guess people might have a different opinion, but so many sports organizations have decided on that, and that's the right call. Uh, Like the Southeastern Conference, eight miles. And and I love this photograph. This was taken down in Tampa Bay a couple of summers ago. You know, it's raining underneath that big cumulonimbus tower, but wait a minute. Where's the lightning striking? Far, far out ahead of the storm. Lightning can run five, six, seven, eight miles ahead of a storm. That's why there's an eight-mile rule, okay? So if there's lightning within eight miles, everything's got to stop, even if it's not raining. It's not raining over there where that lightning is striking. There's not a drop of rain. Some people say, well, I'm going to wait until it starts to rain. No, that's bad. When you hear thunder, you go in even if it's not raining. And listen, forget the eight-mile rule. There's a good chance you're not going to know the exact distance. And yes, you can count the seconds between the lightning and the thunder and get an idea. But this is all you need to know from a practical standpoint. When you hear thunder, that's when you go in, even if it's not raining, okay? But the rule is eight miles. And sometimes lightning can be frightening. Storms are great. We need them. But lightning can be a pest. Ooh, I like this question. What makes a storm severe? A, 58 mile per hour winds. B, one inch diameter hail. Or both. What makes a storm severe? 58 mile per hour winds. One inch diameter hail or both? The right answer is either one, both. C. C is the right answer. Uh, If a storm has winds of 58 miles per hour or greater, then it's severe. Or if the storm has hail one inch in diameter, that's the size of a quarter, the storm is severe. So if it has one of the other or both, then it's severe. So C is the right answer on that one. Uh, a lot of people, they'll call us up and they'll be mad. They're mad at us all the time. James Spann, there's a severe storm in my area and there's, you're not on television. And I'll say, well, why do you think the storm is severe? And they'll say, 
Well, there's a lot of thunder and lightning. Or it's a mean-looking cloud. That, that doesn't make a storm severe. Large hail or damaging wind, okay? So hopefully you got that one right. And, and the criteria is 58 miles per hour, okay? 58. That's the wind criteria. All right, let's go to the next one. Oh, ooh, okay. What is this? What is that picture? It's part of a thunderstorm, a severe storm. A little spotting examination here, storm spotter class. So is this A, a tornado? B, a shelf cloud? C, a wall cloud? Or D, a hurricane? It's one of those. Which one? A, tornado, B, shelf cloud, C, wall cloud, D, hurricane. Come on, spotters, you know this. The right answer is C. Yeah, buddy, a wall cloud. That, you know, most people see that and they're going to report a tornado. Hey, James Spann, there's a large tornado. No. Look down there at the ground. There's absolutely nothing going on. Nothing. That's a wall cloud. Now, those spiral bands kind of wrapping around the wall cloud, those are called striations. That means the wall cloud is rotating slowly, not like a tornado. But this is why we need to know about wall clouds. People say, well, if it's not a tornado, what's the big deal? Well, here's the big deal. This is where tornadoes come from. Now, not every wall cloud is going to produce a tornado, but some of them can. And if you can help us, if you can give us a good report of a wall cloud, then often that can lead to a more timely tornado warning. So we love for people to be trained in storm spotting. And again, uh, our, our spotter class, we, we recorded one of our last spotter classes. If you search on YouTube, Storm Spotter Class Pelham, P-E-L-H-A-M, you can uh, watch that online. And you can join our Sky Watchers. We'd love to have you. We have a, a group together that uh, helps us during times of severe weather. But I hope you got that wall cloud question right, all right? So let's go back to our exam here. Hopefully you're scoring well today. Ooh, another spotter question. What is this? Well, let's just leave the same choices. Is that a tornado? Is it a shelf cloud? Is it a wall cloud? Is it a hurricane? What is that thing? Is it a tornado? Shelf cloud? Wall cloud? Hurricane? The right answer is... B, shelf cloud. B is the right answer. Uh, now, this is on the front of a storm, not the back, but the front. I'm more interested in the back, but that's the front, and this is often seen on the leading edge of a storm, and uh, that has nothing to do with a wall cloud, nothing to do with a tornado. We often call those things CLCs. You know what CLC means? I know you know what that means. Come on now creepy looking cloud but that's a shelf cloud they're pretty much harmless and you can see some strong winds on the gust front with those things but uh, we're more interested in what's happening on the back of the storm okay all right let's talk tornadoes the scale that ranks tornado strength the tornado strength scale is boy that's confusing with all these letters a the d scale b the e scale C, the F scale, or D, the EF scale. So what's the current scale we use to rank tornadoes? One of those four. The D scale, the E scale, the F scale, or the EF scale? All right. Think it over. Your choices are A, B, C, or D. And the right answer, ladies and gentlemen, it is D. D, the EF scale. That is how tornadoes are ranked. And EF stands for Enhanced Fujita. Uh, the original tornado strength scale was done by a guy named Alan Pearson. He was the head of CELS. That's the old version of the Storm Prediction Center a long time ago. This is about 1970. And Dr. Theodore Fujita from the University of Chicago, a famous tornado researcher. And Dr. Fujita kind of took over the scale, and it ultimately became the F scale, the Fujita scale. The weakest tornado is a zero. The biggest is a, yeah, five. 
Uh, and then after Dr. Fujita's death, based on some engineering knowledge that we picked up, the, the scale needed to be adjusted a little bit. And I think Dr. Fujita was doing that anyway before he died. So now we have the enhanced Fujita scale. That's what that stands for. The biggest tornadoes are five, and those are very rare. Hardly any tornadoes are at that strength. Most tornadoes are zeros and ones. But it's important to have that, that scale so we can rank those tornadoes. So good job on that. Most everybody got that one right. All right, let's talk safety. Yeah. For tornado safety, you will annoy your parents until they get, and I mean really annoy them. A NOAA weather radio, that's A. B, helmets for everybody. C, portable air horns, or D, all of the above. For tornado safety, you're going to annoy your parents until they get a NOAA weather radio, that's A. B, helmets for everyone, or C, portable air horns, or D, all of the above. And the right answer is, yeah, all of the above. This is what you need in your house. And listen, it, it's really scary to us how many people that don't have these. And what we've learned is that people think they're going to hear some outdoor siren before a tornado. No, you won't most of the time. No way. During a raging storm at 4 in the morning when your family's asleep, that thing right there, that weather radio, that will wake your family up. So please consider getting one for your house. And also in your safe place, we want everybody to have a helmet. A bicycle helmet is great. You probably already have these. Or a batting helmet if you play sports. Something like that. And little portable air horns that you stick in your pocket. If you need help, you can squeeze that, and the first responders will know how to find you. Okay, so that's some important tornado safety information. But be sure, be sure you got that weather radio. Okay, let's do one more, and we got to wrap this thing up. We're almost at 30 minutes after the hour. Final question. I know we got a few in here that have aced this exam so far. Wow, that means you are a weather dweeb. All right, so some hurricanes have. A nose, ear, eye, or belly button. Some hurricanes have an A, nose, B, ear, C, eye, or D, belly button. Okay? Which one? A, B, C, or D? You know this. Yeah, it's C, I. This Hurricane Michael coming up on Panama City a few years ago, really bad. That was a Category 5 hurricane. Hurricane scale, by the way, is different. That's called the Saffir-Simpson scale. It runs from 1 to 5, but the 5 is the strongest hurricane. And uh, that little hole in the middle, that is an eye. The well-organized hurricanes have those. And it's really eerie. Once you get in there, there is no wind and there is no rain. You look up and you see blue sky and sunshine, but around that eye is the eye wall, the most dangerous part of the hurricane. And by the way, Hurricane season begins on June 1st. Sometimes we can have a little preseason mischief, and we've actually got a system we think that will be forming in the Atlantic north of the Bahamas this weekend. It's not a really classic tropical system. It's going to be called a subtropical storm, but if that thing develops, as expected, the name will be Arthur. That's the first name of the season. Hurricanes get names just like people get names. They can stay out there for days and weeks as long as they're over the warm water. But the water really peaks in, uh, in warmth come August and September. That's when you get the really, really big hurricanes like that one right there. So I hope that you scored well on your exam. And if you didn't, that's okay. Like I say, my exams don't count. They're just fun. But that will give you some opportunities to learn more about weather. So, uh, And if you love weather this summer, just learn on your own. It's amazing what you can find. The online resources. Uh, watch our spotter training video. Go to, uh, like, the uh, Jetstream School from NOAA, uh, the National Weather Service. They've got so many great learning sites. Uh, but thank you guys for watching and for watch, uh, being with us for all these videos here for the past couple of months. It's been great fun for me to do this and really good therapy because I love being in schools. I'm energized by kids in a gymnasium or a lunchroom or a library. Uh, but we'll hopefully be back on the road uh, when the school year starts up in the fall. And in fact, I think about half the school year is booked already. So it's going to be a busy year. Hope you have a great summer. Keep learning about weather. Keep watching the sky. And we'll talk again really soon. Thank you guys for watching.